Welcome to the Financial Flossing Podcast with Ross Brannan, guiding dental professionals to a brighter future. Ross Brannan is a financial advisor who knows it's not just about your teeth. He helps dental practice owners protect and maximize today's cash flow to plan for tomorrow's cash needs. Find him at rossbrannan.com. On the show, he brings together experts to help dental professionals looking to make smart money decisions to grow their income, turn their retirement goals into reality, and improve their lives. And now, here's your host, Ross Brannan. Welcome to the show. Today, we have Dr. Aaron Nicholas based in Maryland. He is a teacher, a practicing dentist, and a dental coach with lots of years of experience to share his wisdom. Dr. Aaron, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. I feel like you just called me old. I mean, maybe? <laughs> hey, a little bit. So uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, Aaron. I mean, you you, you kind of, you've got quite an experience. You, you have what they call they call wisdom and experience can be a polite way of calling you old. And uh, for those of us not watching the video, uh, there might be some gray on the side of your head. But then again, there's gray on my hair, too. So, yeah, I, I understand. Yeah, and I've lost a little more than you have. So, yeah, I, I get that. Um, so I was uh, I graduated dental school in 1987, which was a really long time ago. And for for uh, uh, framing things, remember, no Internet no podcasts, none of that stuff. Rotary Came phones. Uh, barely had phones. We and just, uh, remote, remotes for televisions were not around at the time. Or no, those, were, those were called children. Yes. Change the channel, kid. You know, so, yeah, exactly. So got out, did a scratch start, and things weren't going so well, and kind of cranked along and hired a consultant and, and kind of got things moving. But I just remember that first three to five years was just really painful, uh, both learning the practice end of things and really getting kind of getting your skills down as a practitioner. Because when you when you come out of dental school, you know, they, they take you in off the street and they take you from civilian to you're not going to harm anybody but they don't really get you like super competent or super confident and certainly not very efficient, you know? So you're, you're still really in the learning phase as you're coming out of dental school. You've got a, a lot of people like to say you have a license to learn is what you got. Yeah. There's a lot of parts of uh, whether it's medicine or dentistry, you learn basically uh, the bare minimum from a clinical perspective. Cause then you get, once you go in the world, they don't teach you anything about business. But I'm sure you could speak to all the clinical stuff they don't tell you about in in uh, in in dentistry. But so so you've had uh, you got a, you got a PhD in the School of Hard Knocks, and then you were pretty successful. And but how did you get into the coaching? What what, what happened there? So uh, about year two, I was literally going bankrupt. I could see I was going bankrupt. Um, I had a doc next door to me that was a specialist and they had opened up on the same day, just complete coincidence. And then, and since we're both building practices, I had a lot, we had lots of time to talk. And one day we were talking, I said, well, I, I think about another six months, I won't be here. Um, I just, I, you know, I, I see that I don't have enough money to make it through. And what was going what was going on was I was running out of operating capital on the top end. Wasn't, I wasn't making the money yet. And so we were talking and they said to me, well, you know, Dr. So-and-so in the next town over just hired this consultant and, uh, you know, maybe they could help you out. And so I was like, really? They're dental consultants? I had no idea. I mean, now you, you swing a dead cat and you'll hit three. But back then, remember again, no Internet. You know, they're not advertising on the radio for sure. You know, and so uh, I called the, that consultant up and he came out to my office and we talked for a while. And, uh, you know, they want you to sign up for X number of months and that sort of thing. And uh, I said, okay, so if I sign up with you and make this commitment, how long before you can get me in the black? Because the way I see it, I'm just bleeding cash. And he said, well, I, I think we can get you the black in about six months. And I looked at him and I said, well, that's good. I said, because in seven months I'm going bankrupt and you can get in line behind everybody else. And I'm fairly sure the bank is first in line. And he was like, no problem, let's give it a shot. And I was like, okay. And so I signed up, I did what they told me to do. Um, I was in the black in six months. Um, you know, and that just gets us to you're not 
going to go out of business. Now we actually have to make this thing work. So I was with them for a few years and kind of got to the the furthest extent that I could get with them. And then I kind of knew at that point, where's the next place I need to go. So I hired the next consultant and the next consultant and the next consultant. So what did you do or what did they have you do that kind of uh, righted the ship, if you will? Okay. So don't judge me. Um, remember that I got into dentistry to help people out and I came and I came out and they said, so what is your, scheduling policy. And I'm like, oh, um, well, when they want to come in and we're here, then they can come in. And he's like, okay. He's like, what's your financial policy? I'm like, well, you know, we'll we'll send the insurance in and then whatever's left over, we'll just send them a bill and, and they'll pay us. And he's like, yeah, okay. And then, you know, what's your, what's your uh, um, uh, policy with employees? What's your policy? Like I had no policies. I had no idea what I was doing whatsoever. So everything was just sort of running a, a running mishmash. And so they sat me down and started going through, okay, this is best practices for your industry for doing this. This is best practices for your industry for doing that. And so we started to create policies and procedures in the practice that would actually have people come in get treatment done, pay, and make it all work in such a way that the business would be able to be there in another six months, in another year, and as it turns out, in another 35 years. Okay, so that's kind of where we started. There was just, there was just no organization whatsoever. You were just winging it because they didn't teach you this about, about, about teach you this in dental school. Right, both because of that and because I had two relatives who were dentists, and they were like, oh, you just open up your shingle and, you know, and, and the people come in kind of thing. And they were both from very rural areas, and the only guys around. And so that worked out really well for them. Not so good in an area where there's lots of other choices and lots of other dentists. And, and maybe, you know, people aren't being quite as honest about things as, you know, because they're not seeing you around town every day and they don't have to face you kind of thing. So we got stiff a lot on work in the early days, for sure. So you graduated, if you will, from that consultant and then went to the next consultant and then went to the next consultant. And by that time, it sounds like you were probably basically a consultant yourself. And so is that how you end up becoming a coach? So I, I had a pretty good idea what I was doing. And I hired the, my, the latest consultant, the guy that I'm working with, that I'm, I'm doing coaching for. And after about a month and a half, two months, he looks at me and goes, you know, you don't need me, right? And I'm like, yeah, I know. I said, what I need you for is to make me do what I know I should be doing. I need someone to be account accountable to. And if I write you a big check every month, I'll actually do the work. And so it was completely worth it, um, you know, because we all have great intentions. But then when the you know push comes to shove, there's always something else to do. There's always an excuse for this or that. But if you've got to get on a call with a guy once a week and then tell him why you didn't do the thing you promised you would do, it kind of changes things. Um, after a while of doing that, uh, he, he runs some summits. Um, and, and at the time, he was doing all the coaching calls. He asked me, he said to me, you know, if you're interested in helping some docs out, some younger docs out, I think you really could if you wanted. And I was like, yeah, that would be great. Because I remember what it was like being a young doc and going through all that. And so he asked me to speak at the summit. And I spoke at a number of summits in a row. Uh, and then at some point, he asked me to help him out with some coaching duties. And I started doing that. And that's kind of how I kind of ended up doing this. Um, and I'm still with them, you know, coaching with them. And uh, it's it's been, it wasn't something I was looking for. But it's been a lot of fun doing that. It's made the the last third of my career a lot more interesting than just, uh, you know, um, doing dental treatment chair side all the time. Well, paying it forward and helping people get to where you were at a faster pace and not to deal with the crap you had to deal with and learn your own probably is quite satisfying. Yeah, I think a lot of the reasons why I decided to go into teaching clinical was because I remember how tough it was. Um, those first three to five years. I mean, it was it's it's just awful because when you're in school, you know, you go, you do the work and some instructor comes over and goes, yep, that's good enough. But when you're out on your own, you have to create your own rules. You know, what's good enough? You know, you want it to be perfect, but there is no perfect. But at some point you have to decide enough is enough and this is good enough. And this is this is an excellent result. Maybe not a perfect result, but an excellent result. And you have to make those rules up for yourself. And for me, I was just I was driving myself crazy trying to get it more and more perfect. And at the same time, knowing that wasn't ever going to happen. So you you practiced for a long time, you know, 30 some odd years. You sold your practice three years ago, but you're still practicing two days a week. You're not retiring. 
I right. want record saying multiple times that retirement is a con, and I'm glad that you basically agree with that because you're continuing to do stuff. But as you, after you sold your practice and you're continuing to practice two days a week, you've pivoted and you still do some coaching, but you've pivoted into uh, you know the Monday morning dentistry kind of teaching aspect of it. That's really your main thing now. Talk about that. Talk about the evolution of that. Okay, sure. So as I was looking at that and I'm, I'm talking to docs, both young associates and owner docs, what I'm hearing over and over is young docs are coming out of school and they want mentorship from their owner docs. And you hear it over and over again. Older docs are wanting to hire younger docs who are eager, who are coachable, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, we all, and I did this too when I had associates, you know, we all, you know, we bring the younger docs in uh, as an owner doc and you say, we're going to meet once a week. We're going to talk about cases. It'll be every Thursday or every Wednesday, whatever that day ends up being. And so we're really good about that for the first month, maybe the first two months. Um, and then it starts to break down. Someone's got to put their car in. You got to take the dog to the vet. You've got to, you know, whatever, pick the kid up from whatever. And pretty soon what you have is no mentoring going on. And at the end of a year, what you have is an owner doc that's frustrated because his uh, his associate doc isn't producing any more than they were after the first couple, three months. And you've got an associate doc that's frustrated because all that mentorship they were promised never happened. And at the end of the year, everybody's frustrated. And we're not getting anywhere and they're not happy. And about then, usually the uh, many younger docs are looking at going, hey, OK, so let's talk about like ownership and that sort of thing. And the owner docs going, what are you talking about ownership? like your production hasn't gone up for six months. How can we even start to talk about ownership? So the teaching was sort of a way to start to bridge that gap. And the, the two places I saw a lot of it, well, the kind of the low hanging fruit was um, most owner docs stopped doing root canals a long time ago. You know, they just got frustrated with it. They never got it down to a, a nice repeatable system. And so eventually they went, you know, I can send it down to the end of Donist. He'll send them back. I'll just cut the crown. It takes way less time. I'll be way less frustrated. Well, I'll be happier. So now you got a younger doc coming in. It's like, well, what would be a good way to help fill the younger doc schedule and help bump the production? Well, let's bring some stuff back in house that we've been sending out. So that means root canals usually add to that, that younger docs are trying to build a practice either on their own or within a practice. And usually emergencies is a big part of that. And getting somebody, you know, you take somebody out of pain and they listen to you a little bit more when they, when you say, maybe you should come in for regular care. So this doesn't happen again. So you're trying to build this, but if as a younger doc, you can't do root canals, um, and usually it's going to be a molar if they're in an emergency, then you're going to be sending that patient back out. And the same kind of thing with doing extractions. You know, when you have a, someone come in on an emergency for an extraction, nine times out of 10, it's a molar. And nine times out of 10, it's either broken down so much that you can't grab it with a forcep or it's decayed below the gum line. And if you can't get that tooth out again, you're you've become a triage service uh, for your specialists, which is nice for your specialists, not so good for you. Um, so that's where I started. I actually created two online uh, videos, uh, which are streaming videos, um, uh, surgical extractions for the general dentist and uh, the one hour molar root canal build up and crown. And we put those both online. And well, initially they were this is how long ago it was. Initially, they were DVDs. Then they turned into thumb drives. Then they turned into streaming video that you can get online. Um, and then one time I was at a summit, I had spoken and I was talking to somebody and they're like, so when's the hands-on course going to be? And I was like, oh, um, give me six months. And so we held our first hands-on course six months later. And that's just sort of evolved and snowballed uh, over the years. And so you do a hands-on course twice a year in Maryland, where you're based, and twice a year in Denver in person with, you know, like 15 to 20 people going through these skill sets hands-on, right? Right. And talk about that and like the results you're seeing, the feedback you're getting. Sure. So one of the things that dentists are guilty of is going to CE and doing absolutely nothing with the extra continuing education they've gotten. So I after the first course or two, I realized that one of my big things that was going to have to be kind of nudging doctors to do the thing that they're, they're a little bit anxious about doing it anyway. Otherwise they wouldn't be at the course, um, but getting them to go ahead and, and, uh, and jump in and start doing it. So we run uh, what we call an ROI challenge, return on your investment. 
So the idea is that when you've done enough of this procedure for it to have paid for the investment to come to the course, then send me a, a picture of your last uh, radiograph of the filled root canal um, and I'll send you out a gift. OK, so and it also allowed us to kind of track, you know, what kind of results were we really getting. So what we found was that for most docs that had done any kind of root canal therapy before um, at about seven to 10 days, I was getting pictures back with, you know, ROI in the subject, you know, seven to 10 days after coming to see you seven to 10 days. Oh, wow. So that's, you know, and I, when I saw that, I was like, this is this is amazing. Then you have docs who haven't done anything at all. And this at least gives them a place to start. And one of the things about the one of the problems with teaching endo is that everybody has a well, this and possibly that in my hands, this. And, you know, after if you continue to do it, you eventually have a system. And the problem is it's in your head and you can't bring it out and give it to somebody else. And for docs, for owner docs that had a system, you know, they go, well, you know, I, I show my associate, you know, like when I get into something kind of hairy, I, I bring him over and I show him and I tell him what's going on. What he doesn't realize is that he's learned so much. He, the owner doc, has learned so much before that he's forgotten that it was hard for him to learn that he doesn't realize his, his associate doc is 25 steps behind him and he's shown him the last three steps. And so one of the things we try to do is create a protocol and it's like, it's very objective. It's like, this is step one. You do this until you have this objective met. And now you go to step two, you do that until you have this objective met. And this is how you handle each of these situations along the way. So it makes it very much a, um, a cookie cutter cookbook kind of process. And now if you're not quite sure what to do, and we actually had a, have a, a cheat sheet in their materials. It's like, hey, these are the steps right here. You know, just start an A and then work your way through. And you'll end up being able to do this root canal. And so at seven to 10 days, you know, we get stuff like, hey, you know, this was this was crazy. I'd given up on this and now all of a sudden we're going to do it. I just got one today from the last class. Uh, and it was a, a woman. She said, you know, this patient was 24 years old. She was going to extract this tooth rather than to get the root canal done. I offered to do the root canal for for the price of the extraction. I just couldn't stomach the idea of her of this young girl getting this tooth taken out. And it, it is an ROI yet, but I feel so much better about this, you know. And I've, I've given up on molars. I decided to take your course just to help me with the anteriors, you know, the premolars and the and the incisors. But having done this, I think I might start doing some molars, you know. So you get that kind of stuff that comes back. So it's really gratifying when you see them just out of the gate, you know, and they're and they're doing great. Well, and so you're getting ROI. They're breaking even in seven to ten business days. Yeah. Uh, on on people, I mean, what is the annual ROI? Well, what we figured out was using thirty x. I'm sorry, twenty or thirty x. Probably something like that. What we actually looked at was if we do one of these procedures a week, okay, over the course of a year, how much more money will we bring in? And we figured using my old fees that you're at about sixteen thousand dollars. Is that right? It was 16% on a million dollar practice. What does that come out to? 16,000. About 16,000? Okay. That seems low. No, it's not right. It's, it's higher than that. 160,000. 160,000. There we I was, go. I was doing 1.6%. I'm, I'm yeah, good. that's what I was going. No, that's too low. That's only, a, that's less than a thousand a week. That's not it. Yeah, so $160,000 from doing one procedure extra per week. $160,000 of additional revenue a year. Right. From doing one, one, and the one procedure is root canal buildup and crown, all three together, because we always do them together. Okay. So by doing that one a week, it's an extra $160,000 on a fee for service practice. So it also depends on what kind of practice model you have. But to me, that's, you know, yeah, the ROI is seven to 10 days, but the return on for the year gets big. And the thing is, you take young docs at the beginning of a career, what does that look like over the course of a 25, 30 year career? Oh, it's insane. Well, I mean, here's the deal. Based on what I know you charge for the course, just the cost of the course, sure. you're, you're knocking on the door of 50X of your investment in the course. In the first year? If you do $160,000 of revenue. Okay, fair enough. So, I mean, that's fantastic. So, like, what, I mean, so people are becoming less intimidated by this and and they're and they're – not referring it out and they're doing it on their own their their patients are getting helped and so the results are obviously phenomenal i mean what's it how fast is this growing what, what's happening how fast is the course growing 
Right. What's happening? Is it's I mean, like, are you is it coming to the point where, you know, it's hey, we're booked, you gotta wait six months? I mean, what what's what's starting to happen? Yeah, we're not booked out that far. We we've, we've definitely sold out our last couple of events and had to turn people away. Um, so we added an extra event this year. Um, we also do um, private events. So I've had a couple of uh, docs every year have me come out to their office and train their guys. Um, usually you need to be, you know, have about 10 docs to make that really make sense financial wise uh, compared to just paying and coming to see me. Um, I actually think the number is lower than that, but people don't take into account, you know, flights and um hotels and and stuff like that. So one of the things we are, because um, I just recently went to two days, one of the things we're trying to do is to start to ramp this up, which is part of the reason why I'm talking to you. Um, Try to kind of get the word out and start to ramp this up because it's, I mean, it's one day of CE. And like we said, the the payoff is crazy. The ROI is fast. Um, it just seems like a really valuable thing for, for, uh, younger docs to, to get into. I've had a few older docs come out too. And they're just like, you know, I tried it years ago. It wasn't much fun. I know there's been a lot of advancements. What do you got? Um, and I've had, you know, four or five older docs decide they wanted to pick root canals back up again, you know? So that's so kind of. Who is the, uh, who, who should be taking this course? So if you're not doing root canals, you should be taking it. If you're sure. only marginally doing root canals, you should be taking it. But like, mm-hmm. who else should be taking it? I mean, that's that's most of it right there. If you're a, if you're an owner doc and you want to send your young guys out, I have some owner docs, and they're like, as they bring them in, they're like, this is these this this is the CE we want you to take because they know in dental school they only got to being you know not dangerous. We want you to be more proficient. This is one of the courses we recommend. So we've had that happen. It wouldn't be the worst thing in the world for an owner doc to take it so they could actually train their younger docs, you know, but most owner docs have gotten to the point where they're like, you know, gave it up a long time ago, not interested. I'm just going to send them to you. And then you train them and, and we'll take care of things on the other end. What kind of mindset shifts are needed to go down this road? I think a lot of it is, you, you know, you, um, so I've been in practice 35 years. There have been a lot of things where it's like, I tried it and it didn't work. And then I laid it aside for a while and something got me interested again. I walked in and I tried it again and maybe it did or didn't work, or maybe it worked a little bit better. And I laid it aside again. And then that third time, for whatever reason, all of a sudden it worked and it became a part of our regular, kind of our regular thing. And we, and we ran with it. So it's one of those things where if you've, if you've tried it before, if you've laid it down and said, it's just too frustrating, you know, one of the things we keep saying is this is not an endodontic. This is not an endo course taught by an endodontist. This is an endo course taught by a general dentist who did it for decades and is still doing it, you know, for decades. And so when I went and took implant courses, I took my first one from a periodontist who was a specialist and they had us like drape the whole room. It took longer to get the room ready than it did to do the procedure. Okay. As a general dentist, you can't spend that kind of time. You've got to know, you know, what needs to be, what needs to be sterile, what doesn't, what's important, what's not important. So when you do this root canal, you can't just spend two hours doing this root canal. It's just not going to work in a general practice. And we've been doing it, not spending two hours on it for literally decades. So the course is the one hour molar root canal buildup and crown course. And that is an hour of doctor time. It doesn't include an extra 30 minutes that we need for setup. Uh, and for closing up the appointment um, and for the time that your assistant needs to uh, make the temporary crown for you, um, they're going to put on the rubber dam for you. So, and all of those things we actually started having as a side course, because as our doctors got more proficient, they're like, I can't quite get down to the hour. And we're like, yeah, of course you can't, because you need, you need help from your assistants um, to do those parts that they are legally allowed to do. So now your assistants do everything they're legally allowed to do. You do the part that you're legally allowed to do. Your time in the room's an hour, and they're taking care of everything else. It makes their uh, day more interesting because there is nothing worse than sitting uh, chairside uh, during an endo procedure and doing nothing but suck and spit. You know, that just gets really old really fast. So you, we went back and we were talking about one time, one procedure a week, and that would give you $160,000 of additional revenue. Now, when you were practicing full time, how many procedures did you do a week? Of this, I'd yeah. say probably a minimum of three to four. Um, a lot of times, it's a matter of how many emergencies you could get into the schedule, and if you had a little time around that, because 
typically that's that's where you start is you get an emergency that comes in the door. I did one yesterday. Emergency well, comes in the door. I'm just thinking about this. So whether you want to be a career dentist and practice until you're in your mid sixties or whenever you want to quote unquote retire, um, the revenue that you could create on this is just, you know, quite frankly, ridiculous um, in a positive way. But if you're one of these guys who wants to take advantage of the private equity buyout boom, um, there's no better way to increase your EBITDA than start adding these procedures. Yeah. I mean, it, it certainly helps. And the other thing that it helps get you to is like, you know, we, we all talk about don't just do single tooth dentistry. It's not very profitable. You got to set the room up every time, break it down every time. But if you're starting to do quadrant dentistry and you go, oh, well, I can do that root canal build up and crown and these fillings and that extraction and get that quadrant done and we're over, you become much more profitable than if it's like, okay, I'm going to send the extraction out to my oral surgeon. I'm going to send the endo out to my endodontist. And when they come back, I'll finally do the crown and the fillings and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But it, it moves you towards doing larger cases and, and more work at one time. That's that's fantastic. So if someone wants to learn more about this, where do they go? MondayMorningDentistry.com? Yep. MondayMorningDentistry.com. There's an email link there. I'll actually give you my, my cell number because I've given it out a bunch of times. No one's ever abused it. If you really want to contact me directly, that's cool. Uh, and that's 410-207-3527. And Say it one more time. 410-207-3527. Text me is probably the best thing to do. If you call, I won't answer, but leave a message and tell me who you are and I'll call you back. But that's probably the best way. Online is, is probably the easiest and you can see exactly what we do. You can read testimonials. You can see you know, pictures and videos of previous classes and that sort of thing and, and see the kind of results that we're getting. Yeah, the, check out the web. It's the good website, mondaymorningdentistry.com. can help you find out more about everything you're doing, your courses, testimonials, Um it just seems like this is a no-brainer. Obviously, I'm not a dentist, but it just seems like a no-brainer to drive revenue. Yeah, you just got to be willing to give it a shot. I mean, that's the that's the biggest problem is sometimes people have gotten burned in the past. But uh, this is it's it's a system, um, and it's with objective measurements, and just makes it much much simpler. Well, before we shut down here, any last comments you want to give on this? Um, no, not so much for that. Um, as I told you when we got started, we also do a 90 day accelerator for young docs and go through a, uh, like an online clinical coaching for 90 days. And that also you can find information about on uh, mondaymorningdentistry.com. That's fantastic. Well, Dr. Nicholas, I really appreciate you coming on today. This has been really informative. All right. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. You've been listening to the Financial Flossing Podcast with Ross Brandon. This has been another episode of Financial Flossing with Ross Brandon, guiding dental professionals to a brighter future. If you liked what you heard, consider subscribing wherever you listen to podcasts. For more on Ross Brannan, visit rossbrannan.com. Ross Brannan is a registered representative of Coastal Equities, Inc., and investment advisory representative of Coastal Investment Advisors, Inc. Investment advisory services are offered through Coastal Investment Advisors, Inc., and securities are offered through Coastal Equities, Inc. Member FINRA, SIPC, 1201 North Orange Street, Suite 729, Wilmington, Delaware, 19801.